theory that a person is most honest when they stand in the face of death, in the case of death row inmates facing the death penalty. Many of them are said claimed their innocence until their last breath, while many of them decides to leave this world my stranger note. Here is five shocking last words by death row inmates. Gary Gilmore. Gary Gilmore. At the age of 14, Gary started a small car theft ring with friends, which resulted in his first arrest. He was released to his father with a warning. Two weeks later, he was back in court on another car theft charge. The court remanded him to the McLaren Reform School for Boys in Woodburn, Oregon, from which he was released the following year. He was sent to Oregon State Correctional Institution on another car theft charge in 1960 and was released later that year. On the evening of July 19, 1976, Gilmore robbed and murdered Max Jensen, a gas station employee in RM, Utah. The next evening, he robbed and murdered Benny Bushnell, a motel manager in Provo. Although both men had complied with his demands, he murdered them. The young men were each ordered to lie down and then were shot in the head. Both were students at Brigham Young University. Both left widows with infants. While disposing of the 22 caliber pistol used in both killings, Gilmore accidentally shot himself in his right hand leaving a trail of blood to the service garage where he had left his truck to be repaired prior to murdering Bushnell. Garage mechanic Michael Simpson witnessed Gilmore hiding the gun in the bushes. Seeing the blood on Gilmore's crudely bandaged right hand when he approached to pay for the repairs to his truck, and hearing on a police scanner of the shooting at the nearby motel, Simpson wrote down Gilmore's registration plate number and called the police. Gilmore's cousin Brenda turned him in to police shortly after he phoned her asking for bandages and painkillers for the injury to his hand. The Utah State Police apprehended Gilmore as he tried to drive out of Provo, and he gave up without attempting to flee. Although he was charged with the murders of Jensen and Bushnell, the Jensen case was never brought to trial, apparently because there were no eyewitnesses. Gilmore was executed on January 17, 1977, at 8.07 a.m. by firing squad at Utah State Prison in Draper, Utah. When asked for any last words, Gilmore simply replied, Let's do it. James D. French. James French was serving a life sentence in the Oklahoma State Penitentiary in McAllister for killing a West Virginia motorist who had picked him up from hitchhiking in 1958. French had actually requested a death sentence for that charge, but the jury handed down a life sentence anyway, against his wishes. Dismayed. French wrote several letters to the governor asking for a new trial, one in which he could hopefully get a death sentence, but the letters went unanswered and ignored. While serving his life sentence, French was placed with inmate Eddie Lee Shelton. The two did not get along, in addition to French growing tired of prison life. As a result, on October 27, 1961, French attacked Shelton. According to Oklahoma County District Judge Charles Owens, who was an assistant attorney general during French's time on death row, French determined the victim should have a last meal. So he treated Shelton to a steak sandwich from the prison canteen and allowed Shelton to go to breakfast. Upon Shelton's return from breakfast, French wrapped a towel around Shelton's neck and used it to strangle Shelton to death. 
French was fully aware of the consequences for his actions, making an immediate voluntary confession and explaining that he murdered Shelton because Shelton was stupid and refused to shape up. When he went to trial for Shelton's murder, French asked the judge to sentence him to death and deny all future appeals because he wished to die in the electric chair. And he explained that he committed the murder to compel the state of Oklahoma to execute him. The judge obliged his request. James D. French was executed on August 10, 1966. At the time of French's execution, the death penalty was at a near standstill nationwide as a result of changing sentiments towards the death penalty. Oklahoma's last execution before French's was that of Richard Dare, who died in the electric chair on June 1, 1963. Dare was executed for murdering his father-in-law and notably spent 717 days awaiting execution after his death sentence, which was unusually long for the time. Dare was executed only after a protracted legal struggle. The execution of James French was the last execution by electric chair in the United States before Furman v. Georgia. French's last words before his death by electric chair was, How's this for your headline? French fries. George Apple. George Apple, in December 1927, Apple was committing a holdup in a New York City restaurant when the police arrived. He shot police Lieutenant Charles J. Kemmer, who died of his injury. Strangely, Apple claimed he was innocent of that murder, but in July 1928, a month before his execution, he signed a sworn confession to a November 1927 murder for which another man had been convicted. Daniel J. Graham, ironically, a former police officer, had been hired to guard a construction company's paymaster, Judson H. Pratt. In the 1920s, payrolls were always cash, no checks. Pratt was killed and the $4,700 he'd been carrying was missing. Graham was arrested soon after. He had no explanation for why he hadn't been guarding Graham and no alibi for his whereabouts, so he was eventually convicted of murdering Pratt. Apple and Graham were set to be executed on the same day. George Apple, convicted of murder. George was executed by electric chair, on August 9, 1928. Apple's last words were, Gentlemen, you are about to see a baked apple. Thomas J. Grasso Thomas J. Grasso was a convicted murderer who strangled Hilda Johnson, an 87-year-old woman using her Christmas tree lights on December 24, 1990, in her Tulsa home. He stole $8 from her purse, $4 in loose change, and her television set which he sold for $125. Six months later, after moving to New York with his wife, Lana, he murdered Leslie Holtz an 81-year-old man from Staten Island, on July 4, 1991, stealing his social security check. He was executed by lethal injection at Oklahoma State Penitentiary, McAllister, Oklahoma, United States, on March 20, 1995. On the day before his execution, Grasso released four statements to the press, the first, at 3 p.m., read, What we call the beginning is often the end, and to make an end is to make a beginning. The end is where we start from. The second, released at 8.25 p.m., read, For most of us, 
there is only the unattended moment, the moment in and out of time. And right action is freedom from the past and future also. The first part of the second statement is a line from T.S. Eliot's The Dry Salvages. Shortly before 10 p.m., three hours before his execution time, he issued the third statement in the form of a light-hearted poem commemorating his forthcoming dispatch. The poem was entitled A Visit with Mystery. Ready, willing, and waiting am I. Asked for death but could not die. Each sunrise is one day less. I'll endure this horrible mess. When the last sun does sink, mystery will serve a goodbye drink. On the day our paths do cross it won't take much to see it through. Just a little toxic brew. The warden will read my last creed. And the deadly brew will flow. As the poison drips into my veins. And from my body life does drain. I'll know then once and for all. What last call means when serving toxahole. Grasso requested a last meal, which was two dozen steamed mussels, two dozen steamed clams, flavored by a wedge of lemon, a double cheeseburger from Burger King, a half dozen barbecued spare ribs, two strawberry milkshakes, one half of a pumpkin pie with whipped cream, diced strawberries, and he requested a can of SpaghettiOs with meatballs, though he used his last words to claim that kitchen staff did not honor this request. His last words were, I did not get my SpaghettiOs, I got spaghetti. I want the press to know this. Glass. Jimmy L. Glass was executed on June 12, 1987. Glass was convicted of shooting to death Newton and Erline Brown while burglarizing their Dixie in home on Christmas Day, 1982. Glass and Jimmy Weingall had escaped from the Webster Parish Jail the day before. Glass claimed that Weingall forced him at gunpoint to kill the Browns. Glass made the headlines in 1985 as a petitioner in a Supreme Court case. He argued that executions by electrocution are violating the 8th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution as cruel and unusual punishment. But the court found that electrocution as an authorized method of executions is constitutional. According to then Louisiana's law, the only authorized method of execution was the electric chair. Glass and his lawyers argued that executions by electrocution violate the 8th and 14th Amendments to the United States Constitution. Because causing to pass through the body of the person convicted a current of electricity of sufficient intensity to cause death and the application and continuance of such current through the body of the person convicted until such person is dead, and electrocution causes the gratuitous infliction of unnecessary pain and suffering and does not comport with evolving standards of human dignity. Glass's last words were, I'd rather be fishing. Thank you for watching.